to, to give a, a presentation that we have chosen to call From Radio to Drones, please welcome on stage Lok Dao. This is on. Hi. Hello. So I've been, um, I've been programming since the age of nine, and um, I've been creating for the web for, for 19, almost 20 years, if you can believe that. And I have, a, I have a radio background in music, news, and current affairs. And this is my first time at IDFA, so I wanted to take the, a second to thank Casper for, uh, for having me, and Casper and team, and for being such a big supporter and ambassadors of this industry over the last five, six years. Um, so, yeah, that drone, I, I don't know if I'll talk about drones. That was, that was pretty scary, but I'm going to talk about radio. So in 1994, I started uh, working on this radio show. That was the first webcast with live callers from around the world. Uh, we, we loved uh, Jillian Anderson from the X-Files. who used to come on and host, and, uh, and we, had, um, we, we would, had our show broadcast live in Canada on FM radio and then live around the world in real audio. Uh, we had early interaction by phone, IRC, and email. And it was kind of the, the groundwork um, it, that, that laid the groundwork for what was to come uh, a few years later. So I'm going to fast forward to that. Um, 2000 to 2006, I worked uh, for CBC Radio, um, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and we created this, um, this niche network that I, I like to refer to now as Interactive 1.0. Uh, my, my partner in crime there, Rob McLaughlin, and I were the kind of co-creators and co-executive producers of this product and uh, project. And like Jason was speaking about uh, limits of form, um, for various reasons, we went from uh, almost becoming this big national network with like way too many tentacles to just doing three niche websites that built our foundation. So we, we got to work on, um, on an, uh, kind of what became the largest independent Canadian Canadian music database in the world um, before MySpace was created. Uh, we got to work on something that uh, housed concerts and sessions uh, from artists um, around the world. And then we, we created this the kind of early days of user gen content, um, kind of, I think before YouTube as well, where um, um, we had artists um, upload uh, various works, including in video and audio. So I'm going to show you. Um, something that um, at one point Rob and I had this idea that we should put this all together and we created a weekly digital magazine that would have been perfect for the iPad today and we published six stories a week with a team of 12 producer designers and programmers and I'm, uh, this is a music issue we did I'm just gonna start light on music and let's go to Arcade Fire since Vincent talked about them before So we had them in the studio and recorded a session and photos, wrote a story, put it together. Much younger when... So that's a little, a little peek at, uh, at what a music story looked like back then. And that was, that was done, I think, that was 10 years ago. Um, and then the convergence of, of radio and web, we, we, as, we, as we progress this, this magazine, um, we learned how to tell short form stories, sound driven stories, and mix in indie music and culture. So, um, and sometimes we tried to be a little funny as well. One day, Bert woke up and Ernie was gone. His bed was empty, left in a mess as usual. Bert was concerned. He thought maybe there would be a note on the kitchen table saying, Bert, I've just gone to get the paper. But there wasn't. Bert made his bed and Ernie's bed, and then he made himself some breakfast. All the while, he was telling himself that everything would be okay, that Ernie would come bouncing in any minute with a bouquet of flowers he'd been picking in the meadow or a robin's egg he'd found in the park. Ernie did things like that. He was a very irritating person, really, and for a few minutes, Bert even managed to enjoy the peace and quiet. As time went on, though, he became more and more worried. Where was Ernie? By two o'clock in the afternoon, 
Bert was in a state of complete anxiety. He took several walks, looking for Ernie in the park and the meadow, at the corner store, the library, and the movie theater. Each time he came back home, Bert would think, I'll walk in the door and there he'll be, perky and peppy as ever, not even caring that I'm out of my mind with worry. And although he was furious with Ernie for being so insensitive, every time he came in the door and Ernie wasn't there, Bert was overcome with a disappointment so great that once he actually cried a little. So Bert never comes back. Yeah, it's sad. So we, in, in that time, we, we, as radio producers, we embraced the, the real DIY ethos. So we, you know, we took those photos, we created the radio stories, we learned how to mix and match and start pairing things together. And, and that kind of became the early days of Interactive for us where we, we, we figured out how, how do we work with music and stories and how do we start dealing with this audience that is now completely interconnected. And you know, this was the early days of broadband as well when we put this out. Um, like like Jonathan was saying yesterday, uh, we we were we were doing this half for modems, right? So this this thing actually worked on a fast modem, and we and it's it's interesting when you when you think of you know your various audiences and how they're going to consume this. So we produced 105 issues of this magazine, and you know learned a lot over time, and and the stories got deeper and and more serious um, as um, as we went. Get up, the sound, stand up. I crack the mix up, yeah, fill it up, fill it up. I miss it, how much I get the louder toys when you live in the city. There's more people to annoy. The cops gonna come blow my house down. Whoopers and tweeters and the sounds around. And the hubs in my pocket, they're thinking nothing of it. To grind it up, roll it up, sticking them out to light it up. Up and up, it's on a mission. Up and up, stop a world transmission. Up and up, it's on a mission. Up and up, stop a world transmission. We get x rated. Sound right here, and we'll get it all night. Sad people, happy people, sick people, well people, any kind of people, dark people, light people, pink people, black people. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a girl. Actually, there was a girl's club. We're going to interview everyone. So as we got to the, the end of the three-year run for this, uh, this project, we learned uh, a lot about the early forms of interactive um, photo essay. We learned to... You know, we started doing a lot of interactive photo essays and started touching on documentary and... Um, and by the end, we actually had uh, incorporated video in as well, um, which unfortunately doesn't uh, exist in the archive.
damn archiving issues. And uh, during, um, at the end of this project, um, Rob and I actually met, uh, met Kat Sizek and um, got, were able to work with her on uh, Filmmaker in Residence together. And then um, after that, fast forward to um, 2009, um, I, that's when I joined the NFB and uh, uh, Rob, Rob was there and another NFB person who, I think he had to step out to go help his group, but Ug Sweeney who is here, he's launching Fort McMoney tomorrow. Um, so we uh, created uh, NFB Interactive and we had created a digital strategy and we created 30 projects in the, the next three years. Um, including some of the ones you've seen already. So I'll just give you a quick highlight reel of that. That snare had a braking strength of two tons. You know, I'm wearing a, a VHF collar and I have my own radio frequency. They also gave me a number. Bear 71. Banff National Park in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. Bears and humans here live closer together than any other place on Earth. That explains the radio caller constantly beeping my location to some ranger playing God. There are 15 remote sensing cameras in my home range, plus infrared counters and barbed wire snags to collect my hair. Mouse click. Click. Mouse click. I was nine, living in Yellowknife, and went there for a hockey tournament. Adam League, ten and unders. I don't remember much. The 45 minute plane ride, those giant propellers. This isn't the plane. My team's not on it. But it is Pine Point, around the time I was there. We're here at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, and uh, we're studying the beluga whales. This is a very threatened population. My name is Zanilia. I make music, um, write poetry, act, um, anything that has to do with entertainment. Once a month I'll do brunch. I get $20 for making breakfast. Not a whole lot, but it helps. 
It gives me something to do. It keeps me out of trouble. It's your turn now to invest part of your night. I don't sleep very well. I guess my mind is usually too active to sleep, or sometimes I'm just not comfortable. I'm going to actually end this early here because um, of time. I'm going to go into this project in, in a sec. But I wanted to talk about the evolution of the interface. Um, I, everyone's kind of touched on it before um, today. It's something that you know, we, we're, all, we're all wishing, wanting, and struggling with. Um, you know, we're playing with the Oculus Rift. We're playing, with, or playing. We're working with 3D engines, game controllers. But you know, the, the, for me, the ideal would be the kind of transparent gestural interface, right? And that's that's what we're kind of working towards. Hopefully, we're going to try some of that in our interactive installations coming up. But um, in the in the near term, we've been working on um, just even learning more about the touch interface and gyroscopes and how to use how to really create better stories for for that thing in your pocket and and the iPad. So um, the the latest project that we created, we created a new version of an interactive photo essay story for tablet and we made it for tablet first and then we adapted it back to the web which is a whole different experience but it was one that I, I completely found wor worthwhile doing. So the project's a story by Alexis Hobbs about his grandfather's last hunt. His uh, grandfather Pitt was a, a draft dodger um, because he, he well, he, he was actually, he had joined the military, but he, he quit the military because of a woman he loved and went and lived in the woods and lived off the land and hunted. And he eventually paid a price for it, went to jail and got out. But the project's a really touching story um, about family bonds and, and our mortality. And it's, uh, it's available in the Apple App Store and, and the Android, Android App Store. So no, you have to, it's it's okay to watch it like this, but try download it if you can. It's free, and it's much much better when you're actually interfacing with it. The um, we have a new project coming in uh, in 2014, and this one this one I'm really really excited about. It's kind of our um, I think it's our next story world follow up to uh, to Bear 71, and we're lucky to be working with uh, an artist uh, like Stan Douglas, uh, and um, and his um, and be able to work on his new project as a, as an app. So. Um, um, circa 1948 is the name of the project. Um, it's going to be an iPhone and iPad app. Um, it's set in Vancouver, so this is an aerial view of, uh, of Vancouver. We go back in time to 1948 to Vancouver right after World War II, and we have a well-off west side and a poor east side of town. We have a class war, we have government corruption, racial tension. And uh, here's, a, here's a photo from that location, one of the rare ones that still exists. And then here's the the render. Um, a little crowded. Uh, same area. Trying to squeeze me out. You're paranoid. What do you want? You know this. Where's this? What is it? He's looking for an address. Let's take a look. So this is an augmented, um, or not augmented reality, but uh, this is a um, a tablet app using the gyroscope, and you you drive it around and move move through the world. I'll show you another clip here of one going into a building. What are the stakes? Just for fun. We'll learn if there's no money involved. We'll start with a hundred dollar stack. <laughs> That's an expensive tutorial. Pay attention, they'll pay for itself. All right, here we go. 
So, uh, what's the word at the mayor's office? Oh, he's got a big set of crosshairs fixed oh, right about where I'm sitting now. I guess I'm in for the one. Sounds like you're aiming to duck for cover, Maurice. I'll call. This neighborhood has been designated the symbolic battleground for law and order. What's that, a dollar? I'll raise you two. I'll raise you five. Hmm. So that gives you a sense of what you'll see. These are all um, vector 3D rendered environments created in my, uh, going through a custom engine we wrote um, for iOS. And that engine's going to be hopefully uh, adapted. The Maya 3D renders are being adapted to um, Stan is producing a play um, privately in parallel as part of the, the story world. And in the play, they um, shoot the actors live with a green or blue screen. And then the actors are then dropped back into the 3D environment. And, um, and the 3D environments and the, everything you see here is rendered live uh, on stage. So the Circus Story World will have a, an iPad app, an iPhone app. Uh, it's going to have a website with a history of, um, of Circa 1948. Um, we're hoping to bring a live event version to, um, to film festivals and also create an installation. And then um, there's also a play with that. So I know I'm at the edge of my time here, so I'm just going to qu quickly go into one, um, one project in development. This is a project we're working on. Um, called Black Box Big Data. We're working on this project with Film 4 and Lance Weiler and the Harmony Institute in New York. And um, it's, um, it consists of a short narrative um, film, um, fragmented narratives from many platforms and uh, interactive documentary and connected objects. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a story, um, it's a project about um, identity and privacy um, in the digital age. And, uh, and it's going to be using some open source hardware, the connected objects. Um, we've just um, only done early, um, early designs for this, this black box that's part of a Faustian bargain that we're going to have users embark on as part of the I interactive installation and, um, and part of the story world. And because Casper asked, maybe we'll put a drone in the project. So I, I have w one little thing to show, but I'm out of time, so should I stop? It's fine? Yeah. Okay. So drones aside, um, here's a project that is coming out in 2014 um, um, that I just wanted to, uh, called The Devil to Devil's Toy Redux in English. In French, I think it's going to be called uh, The Devil's Toy Remix. I don't know if Marianne can confirm that. Um, and here's a little uh, snippet of it. <laughs> These are the remains of what was once a beautiful city. For it was like a plague which spread from city to city, an epidemic from which no one was secure, a dread disease which needed only pavement in order to multiply and proliferate. <laughs> Devil's Story Redux, it's, um, it's a remake of, uh, or many remakes of um, Claude Jutra's uh, seminal film, The Devil's Toy, Le Houli Houlin, uh, that came out in the 60s, one of the first uh, skateboarding films. Um, there's filmmakers all around the world have made their own version of it, and you'll be able to participate in the project as well. So that's uh, coming out um, next year. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much for, I think, a very, very interesting recap of also your career and how you have kind of developed and been on the forefront in, in many stages. So, I mean, working with, um, with sensors, data collecting, all these new opportunities, how do you think this is going to influence documentary filmmaking? That's, that's a really, it's a big, I mean, we've had a, obviously a lot of talk, uh, talks about this. I mean, the, you know, is, is live documentary still documentary, right? Mm. It, it, you know, if we have, is adaptive, generative storytelling, is that still documentary? Mm. So, I mean, we're, we're ex definitely exploring that. Yeah, there was more I could, like, we're, we've been playing with, you know, this notion of generative film as well, in, as influenced by data, by mm. your social graph and, and data inputs, but... Yeah, I don't. I don't know until we kind of go through that process and and put one out. It's it's really hard to tell. Hmm. Anybody with questions in the room? I know we have difficulties coming uh, working with the Wi-Fi, so we're gonna allow questions also from the room since the the Twitter is not totally up and running. I guess with people having difficulties. Anybody with questions? There's a question over here. We have a microphone coming here. So I'd like to ask a really vulgar question. It's about the funding, it's about the, the money. Um, what you presented, um, not the, quite the last one, but you presented the project that was the play, the installation, the website, etc. It sounds fantastic, but is the National Film Board um, extremely well off to fund these things? Or can you tell us a wee bit more about how you go about funding projects that are so multi-platform? We... Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going through hard times just like everyone else, and we've, ha we've had cutbacks. So it's not, yeah, we're not, by no means um, have a lot of, of budget to spare, but, you know, that, the play is actually being produced by Stan and, and um, with outside money, right? So um, the last project you saw, um, we're actively seeking licensing for it in order to be able to complete it. And um, the other one I showed, um, it's in... Um, Part, it hopefully will be in co-production with Film4 and a third party as well. So you know, I think we're, we're in that same boat as well. We can make a certain size for a certain budget, but in order to, to do the bigger, we need partners. Okay. We have to wrap it up here, but thank you very much, Locke. I think it was very interesting to thank see you. the span that you have been through in, in your career. Thank you very much. Thank you.